Well, I am so glad to welcome into the podcast, Dr. Neil Shinvi, and he comes to us from North Carolina. And Neil, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you, Andy. I followed you for a long time. I appreciate your work, but uh, maybe I, I almost said, tried to describe what you do and you have a really unique vocation. So why don't you describe uh, what it is that you, how you, how you describe your work um, to my audience? Well, I self-identify as a homeschooling theoretical chemist. So Amen. I was, I have a PhD in theoretical chemistry and was trained in theoretical chemistry. And, uh, but I, and I worked at Duke for several years and then around, gosh, I think it's nine years ago, I quit my job at Duke to homeschool my four, our four kids. My wife's a doctor. And so I've really enjoyed that. And it's given me the time to pursue other interests, uh, one of which is the stuff we'll talk about today, which is sort of critical social theory. Yeah. And, and, and then on another side, too, you also have an apologetic side, like you have a book that's come out in the last year. That isn't and most people might know you now for your work in critical theory and sociology and these type of critiques that you have, but that's more of a pure apologetics book if, if there is such a thing. Yeah, that's right. It's it's nothing to do with critical theory. And so I warn people, you know, you're welcome to buy the book, but it's just going to be about the gospel. And my you know original passion was sharing the gospel with my colleagues, scientists who were skeptics, agnostics, atheists, and explaining to them why Christianity was true. So that uh, that came to that. That's why I wrote the book I did, so that I could give it to people who were sort of highly intellectual um, and wanted to understand what Christians believe and why we think it's true. So that, but it does not contain any of the. That book was finished in 2015, 2016 or so. It was published oh, okay. just this uh, last year by Crossway. But yeah, it's not. Don't go to that looking for social commentary. It's all about the resurrection, the gospel, things like that. And that theme is important to you because you came to Christ later in life. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. So I became a Christian at UC Berkeley while getting my PhD in theoretical chemistry. And uh, through, you know, through a lot of things I mentioned in the book, uh, I met my future wife, Christina, in college. She was a Christian. I went to church with her at UC Berkeley. And then I read C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters like 20 times as a non-Christian. <laughs> it was just fascinating to me. And other things like that. So um, it definitely that was what made me realize that uh, as a Christian now, I, I should be able to communicate my faith to other people and explain it to them, especially people who had my similar background in science. Yeah, interesting. Well, and I resonate with the side that you all, all often say I'm the homeschooling theoretical chemist and I'm, I'm a homeschool dad, but I'm not the full throttle throttle. Like I think you are actually the homeschooler. I'm thankful for my wife who's doing that, taking on that task. But anybody who leads with the fact they're involved with homeschooling, that's a good sign to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, um, I had heard of some of your apologetics work before 2020. And I think somewhere in 2019, um, before the the challenges came up that were made all of the things that are being expressed so apparent, um, William Lane Craig read one of your articles on his podcast, Reasonable Faith, and and he and his uh, co host just kind of talked through oh, like a simplified article you had on critical theories, mm -hmm. and it that was a, a a moment for me where all of a sudden several things came together that i was struggling with i i wasn't i mean black lives matter had come around a few years before it came to prominence kind of in the evangelical world through an urbana conference i had worked myself intellectually through that like recognizing there was more involved that organization but i hadn't pieced together how it was related to all of these other movements so i'm curious when was it that you started to see this as something that you needed to talk about in your own ministry that's a good question. So I also focus because of my emphasis on apologetics for a long time, while I was writing my my new book and um, researching it and speaking on science and faith, things like that, I tended to shunt politics to one side. I'm still very apolitical. I'm just not interested in how people vote. I mean, I care about it, but you know, it's just not I focus on the big things, the gospel, a Christian worldview. And I was happy to set aside cultural and political issues to, to think downstream from theology, which is that's correct. We, we first think about theology and then how it impacts politics, not how our theology should change in order to support our political position. So right, right. I was happy to do that. But around, like you said, around 2015, 2016, I began seeing a shift in uh, public figures, people I knew personally, 
Christian leaders and how they thought about things like race and gender, even sexuality. And I couldn't figure out why. I, I Like you, I think all of us were kind of in a daze. Something's going on. I hear words I don't understand. It seems something's not quite right, but I couldn't put my finger on it, finger on it. And then it was, you know, I got to pinpoint the year. I think it was 2016, but there's a big snowstorm. And I was uh, a mutual friend said, you have to get in contact with Dr. Pat Sawyer. Uh, He was also a member at Summit Church uh, where I attend, I remember. And he was interested in apologetics. So mutual friends said, oh, get together with him. It's a big snowstorm. He couldn't make it. Then months later, we finally met and we sat up until like 2 or 3 a.m. just talking about stuff. And then and I asked him, well, what do you do? And he was getting his Ph.D. in education and cultural studies at UNC Greensboro. And his thesis focused on cultural foundations and he employed critical theory. Mm -hmm. Oh, tell me about it. We talked about what he was studying and researching. I realized, wait a minute. This sounds a lot like what I'm hearing in the evangelical church today. And it's funny because we, and he said, no, that, that's impossible. There's no way that a biblically grounded evangelical Christian could even for a second entertain these ideas. So we actually had this discussion via email where I, had, I was like, no, I really think that these ideas are infiltrating the church. And he was like, There's, that's impossible. They're so patently unbiblical. He was saying, I got involved in this field in order to share the gospel with my secular progressive atheist colleagues. He never thought he'd be addressing these ideas in the church setting. But after a few exchanges, we finally said, you know what? I think I think you're right. So we began collaborating around in 2016, 2017. And one of my first books that I read was uh, Anderson Collins' book, Race, Class, and Gender, which William Lane Craig then found the review of it and read it on air. And then that's how I, uh, that was sort of the first time I, <laughs> my big break, I don't know what to call it. Oh, oh, so this is a common story for you. Like you've heard several people have, like me. But got, yeah, uh, became so, aware some people have that. mentioned that, right? And, uh, but it was the story of how, because it's true, I was totally content to just focus on the gospel, theology, things like the resurrection, who is Jesus? That's That's what I mainly care about. But I've come into this discussion I have to emphasize, not because I'm trying to sway your political views, because I'm concerned about your theology that yeah. is being that it's tied up with how you're thinking about things like race. And so I keep emphasizing to people, it's I'm not trying to get you to vote for Donald Trump. It's not, it's not my goal. It's <laughs> right. not my it's, it's I am looking down the road and seeing that the positions you're taking with respect to race, class, gender and a host of other issues mm-hmm. are coming from a faulty view of these categories that itself is going to lead to profound deconstruction of your faith in five or 10 years. And I, and we're seeing that in real time. I mean, we began in 2017 or so collaborating. There were people that were insisting, Oh, these are, these are not, these are not problematic ideas. They're totally fine. It's all a boogeyman. You're making it up. And now five years later, we are seeing the completely rotten fruit of a lot of these ideas. So it's definitely a real concern. Yeah. And, and I, what I want eventually we'll talk about, like the way this has expressed itself in the scholarly works of some historians. Mm-hmm. But w- before we get to that, what are some of those principal theological challenges that you see being confronted by these perspectives on race, class and gender? So, yeah, there are a ton. So yeah. um, maybe we should back up and talk about what the framework is that people are embracing unknowingly. Sure, sure. And then you can see how it plays out. So. Uh, the, the perspectives that are being promoted all of our culture, all the, the woke phenomenon we see today in the press, in, in movies, in entertainment, in, uh, from athletes, from entertainers, all, all of these ideas in education and politics, those ideas uh, are coming from something called critical social theory or critical theory. It's, the the yeah. nomenclature is not, not clear in the literature. Uh, but that's a tradition that goes back to Karl Marx. And it's not his ideas about economics that really have impacted society going forward, not as much in the US at least. Um, it's his ideas about how power operates and, and circulated right. within society to produce uh, oppressor groups and oppressed groups. So right. that was, and that, that was not really, Marx. Marx was all about economics and class division. But then later theorists like the Frankfurt School in the 20s and 30s they applied Marx's ideas in a framework more broadly than just to economics. They wanted to apply it to things like culture, mass media, conformity, and to look at how, again, power within society 
created the stratification between the haves and the have nots, not just at the material level of money, but also in terms of culture, who had cultural power. And then that from that early Frankfurt School uh, critical theory in the 20s and 30s, there, there were spawned entire disciplines like post-colonialism, uh, queer theory, critical race theory, critical pedagogy, cultural studies. These are all uh, disciplines that fall underneath the umbrella category of critical theory. So you have critical theory is overarching right, right. umbrella category. Within that tradition, you have various critical social theories like critical race theory, critical pedagogy, queer theory, intersectional feminism, and so forth. Now, there are we, I and my, my collaborator Pat and I have identified sort of four core ideas that motivate and animate these critical theories today. We call them the contemporary critical theory. And the four ideas are the social binary, hegemonic power, lived yeah. experience, and social justice. So really briefly, yeah. uh, a social binary just means that society is divided into oppressor groups and oppressed groups along lines of race, class, gender, mm -hmm. sexuality, physical ability, age, immigration status, religion, and a host of other factors. So there are always, there's all these oppressor and oppressed groups. And there you can find tables. They've listed all these different oppressions, racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism, cisgenderism, ageism, adultism. They'll break groups into oppressor or oppressed, like male or oppressors and female or oppressed, or uh, Christians or oppressors and non-Christians are oppressed. So and if you look at their their tables, you know, something like 95% of the United States population is oppressed with respect to one or more identity markers. Like 5% wow. like of the US is actually not oppressed, but everyone else is oppressed I, in some way. That's the social binary. And then people will say, wait a minute, 95% of the US is oppressed. I mean, right. oppression means cruelty, tyranny, coercion, violence. We think about brutal dictatorships. So how, slavery, how can you claim that 95% of the US is oppressed? Well, the answer is, Critical theory has redefined the word oppression hmm. to include something called a hegemonic power. Hegemonic power means that the ruling class, whether it's whites or men or heterosexuals or Christians or the rich, they've imposed their values on society. So they have hegemonic power to impose their white, male, Western, rich, heterosexual, Christian values on culture in a way that makes those values seem normal common sense, objective, God ordained. Mm -hmm. And then when they, and then, so all of us are sort of brainwashed into the system, these systems of oppression and that is oppression. So the oppression is when the ruling class imposes its ideas on society that leads to oppression leads some, and it, and it justifies their own power and privilege. So the argument would be something like, you know, men justify their own dominance in society by saying, well, men are just equipped to lead. In fact, men are uh, it's got ordained that men be leaders. That's why it's right for us to be in charge of everything. So that's mm. how all women are oppressed by the quote unquote patriarchy, which is this collection of ideas that valorizes masculinity and demeans femininity. That's the idea anyway. Yeah. And then, okay, that's, so that's how oppression is redefined in terms of hegemonic power, the power to impose ideas and values on culture. But then how do you break out of that? And the answer is lived experience. Number yeah. three, that through the lived experience of oppressed groups, they can come to recognize their oppression. So people that are, are oppressors, people that are privileged are blinded to their privilege. They're blinded to the reality of injustice because they have both conscious and subconscious reasons to ignore reality. But then, and also ironically, uh, oppressed people, marginalized people are also blinded naturally because they're also right. socialized into the same systems of dominance. So they also say, yeah, of course, well, men should be in charge. So they have what's called internalized oppression. Right. But through their lived experience, they can wake up, they can get woke, achieve a critical consciousness. They can then recognize and name their oppression. And because of that, their, their blindfold has been taken off. So they can see now. And so if you're part of a privileged oppressor group, you should defer to their authority. You should say, oh, they can see and I'm blind. Therefore, they should tell me what reality is actually like. I should, they have special access to truths about their oppression. And then finally, the end goal, number four, is social justice, where uh, the critical theory wants to overturn the social binary. They want to eliminate all forms of social oppression, by which they mean all ways in which the ruling class, whether it's whites, men, or heterosexuals, or Christians, have imposed their values on culture. They want to deconstruct that, dismantle these systems and structures that justify the dominance of the ruling class and to achieve a state of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So those are, so that's a, sorry, really yeah, fast no, summary. No, this is great. 
fast summary no, I, of the core ideas of contemporary critical theory. And, and once you get those ideas, uh, Professor once told me years ago, I explained critical theory to him in a, in a lecture. And afterwards, he came to me and said, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you grasp wow. those ideas, you're like, that's literally everywhere. All these expressions of quote unquote wokeness and culture that they don't seem to even make sense sometimes. If you fit it into this framework, you're like, they make complete perfect sense. Would you accept these assumptions? Well, right. all this other stuff follows immediately. Yeah. I can remember where I was when I was listening to that podcast, when they put your ideas together and just summarize them. I can, I can remember the exact moment because I felt like it, it brought such clarity to the tensions that I was feeling. And this was before 2020, before we had uh, George Floyd and all the mm. challenges there. And, and I just encourage people to go just um, go to your website and even um, YouTube your uh, Neil's name and you can find some examples where he gives a much longer explanation explanation of this and provides details um, and comes at it really through a, a com compassionate lens as well. One of the things that happens, you know, you think about social justice many years ago, you would use the language social justice and it was almost just generic outreach, just mm -hmm. doing it. And then you're not realizing that you're, there's terms that come very loaded with other explanations behind them. Mm -hmm. So that's been something I've had have had to work through myself. And the same thing with all of these areas. Now, one of the things that happens for you that I think is interesting is that when you put together an argument against some of these theories, the people, they don't necessarily know your background. They'll say, there's just another white man. And of course, you say, I'm not a white man. This right, is right. Kind of I'm, a, I'm a person of color. I mean, I, my dad's Indian. My mom's white. So I have some some ability to push back and just say, you can't just dismiss my I mean, it's, it's obviously a logical fallacy to say he's a white male, therefore his arguments are false. It's just, that's an, an, it's just not true. It's a genetic fallacy. But in our, because our culture has imbibed these ideas so deeply, it's a reflexive response. Do you hear an argument you don't like? It must be a white male. And ironically, of course, <laughs> the funny thing is that if I point out, well, actually, I'm not white, I can already tell you the response. The response is, right. yes, but you're enacting whiteness. I've been accused right. of what? So once I say, well, I'm not white. Yes, but see, you don't understand that whiteness is an ideology that you've imbibed. So it doesn't really matter what your skin color is or your back. And I say, I, under I actually do understand that. I I'm pushing back against that very concept. I reject that definition of whiteness. <laughs> but it, you can see how it's it really becomes this. It's a, it's a worldview. It's functioning as a way that they see all reality. So one of the big problems with it, one of the many ones, is that it's unfalsifiable because if you bring an argument against it, you'll be right. told you're promoting your white privilege. Well, you're not white. Well, you're promoting your internalized racism and you're parroting, you're parroting the ideas of the ruling class, which you've absorbed because you're not yet woke. You have not achieved a critical consciousness. So there's, but there's no way to critique it because they'll respond. You're, you're, you're either parroting the ideas of the ruling class or you are justifying your own power and privilege. Yeah. There's no, there was no way to answer that. It was interesting. I went to an evangelical seminary and we'll work through some of these questions. And I remember reading divided by faith and then united by faith, which you've reviewed on your mm -hmm. website. And I wasn't too, I, I remember thinking like, well, maybe I could, and they have some in there. You, you've talked about it kind of the evangelical tool belt um, mm -hmm. that works through all these challenges and individualism and a host of other things that are part of this. And I, I took some of that on. I just decided to adopt some of that language. And, and, and this is a school that wouldn't do that sort of thing now because I think they're, they're aware of it. But at the same time, like I walked out of this, uh, out of the seminary, even using language that would be connected to Marxism and oppressed and oppressor, much less than also thinking about redistribution of the wealth that my, the social action I did mm -hmm. was a part of righting wrongs that had been historically done to people in the past. And it, I didn't, I didn't see it until I was actually like working in the Salvation Army for 15 years. I served as a Salvation Army officer. When I realized as I was seeking to serve the poor, these ideas weren't working. Yeah. Right. This was like, like I, I had this language from an evangelical seminary that was at the background of what I was doing, and and even even work I was doing in communities where I was sometimes the only white person. Mm -hmm. I like I was looking at it through this lens, but I wasn't finding it 
to be something that was giving people answers or freedom or helping people economically, uh, helping people through you know, to get out of homelessness and all sorts of things like that. So I found it to be very helpful to even have these categories that help de define what, even what I had read and to kind right. of walk, walk out of it, so to speak. Um, so I feel like mine was a reverse woke. Mm -hmm. uh, I went back yeah, to sleep, woke. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I want to pass on you. I've seen you do some reviews over the past few years on, um, and, and you've spoken out and, and I don't know if people have actually re responded to you. I'd be interested in Kristen Kobez Dumay and G she's written the book, Jesus and John Wayne, mm -hmm. um, Allison Bars, uh, the, the Making of Biblical Womanhood. I don't know if any of these folks have actually reached out to you, but I've seen you to make some really strong uh, arguments against some of the the kind of underlying the, well, their, their use of one of those four things, right? There's hegemonic power to be the way to interpret history. But just recently, well, in the last three months, you've hmm. put you put out an article that is uh, kind of coalescing these ideas and kind of seeing common themes in this, and also um, Jamar Tisby's work, The Color of Compromise. Mm -hmm. I'd love for, love for you to help um, my audience understand what is kind of going in into the process that these historians are taking and presenting, particularly evangelical culture. Yeah. So one thing I realize is that a lot of these ideas I've outlined. They're just in the water today in in academia. It, it's not like you have to go to school and study critical theory to embrace this framework. You can be studying right. history or sociology or any of these things. These these ideas are so prom prominent within academia and all these different fields that I think sometimes people don't even realize they're like you said. You embrace these ideas as terminology without knowing the underlying ideology that they can that it came from, and that's a so that doesn't happen just to random seminary students. It happens to even scholars who just say, well, isn't it obvious we live in like a cis heteropatriarchy? And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? They're like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just what we talked about in, in cultural studies class today. So it's why when I critique these books, um, I'm careful not to say, well, these books employ critical theory, therefore they're false. That, that Well, yeah, you yeah, can't exactly. do that. Right. You yeah. have to, because so now I do think and I explain how the framework that's been adopted by these books does seem to me, and in some ways I'll bring it out very clearly, that they are influenced by critical theory. Right. But my argument is, isn't they use critical theory, therefore it's false. My argument is, right, here's right. why it's false. And by the way, where are they getting these ideas? Oh, it sounds very similar to what we're hearing from critical theory elsewhere. So that's just upfront. We should always critique yes. the claims being made, not the source of the claims, right? But the claims uh, I was seeing in uh, these books, so I the they're actually all. It's interesting. A few, I think, it was last year actually, a guy named David Gashi, who's a progressive evangelical. Yeah, uh, he wrote a piece in Religion News Service, I think, or uh, some some it was an article about what he called. Uh, a project to deconstruct the intellectual foundations of, of uh, evangelicalism. So he called it that. Wow. And he cited Dumay. Uh, so Kristen Cobes Dumay, Beth Allison Barr, Jamar Tisby, I think Robert Jones and Thea Butler, and a bunch of other scholars, or Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry. Um, he cited a bunch of these scholars and said they're involved in a project to undermine evangelicalism, the theology wow. intellectually. <laughs> and then on, so he wrote the article, then on Twitter, all of, every single one of those scholars amplified his claims and said, and, and liked it and, re, and shared it and retweeted it and said, yes, we are all in this together. Okay. So the funny thing is I had, I think prior to that, or prior to seeing it, I'd written an article naming exactly the same books and saying they're all involved in the same project. So here's, and then Jonathan Lehman, who's a, a Baptist pastor and out of DC, I think, he named the same authors and called it the, de the Evangelical Deconstruction Project. So we have three independent sources saying wow. all these books are related. And again, it, I had no idea this article even either it hadn't existed when I wrote the article, or but it was not at all like I was copying anyone. So the point is, we 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 and they themselves say, yes, we are part of the same right, project. Right, right, right. Um, and actually, they even cite each other sometimes in their books. So Barr cites Tisby, for example, or, uh, and I go into this in my review. The point is, what are they all doing? The overall uh, approach of all of these books is the following. 
first they identify some real historical problem, slavery, uh, racism, white supremacy, uh, patriarchy, actually really bad, or even in the church today, they'll point to really terrible abuses that happen today, sexual abuse, cover-ups, really weird chest thumping masculine displays of like, you know, this, this weird stuff that goes on in churches. You're like, yeah, that's, that's not biblical masculinity. So they'll point out real problems. The step two then is take those real problems and say, okay, uh, that comes under a larger category of say racism in the church, right? So it's not just that these are you know, narrow eruptions of some problem in the church. It's that this is a pattern we see historically. It's, it's, it runs throughout the, um, runs throughout the evangelical church. And really the real reason that, um, that these problems are happening is that the, the church is endorsing these ideas. They're, comp- they're not just sporadically happening in random churches, that the evangelical church as a whole is complicit in these actions. Now, right. again, sometimes that was true. The uh, evangelical church as a whole, or the church, say, there's a whole, say, during slavery, was pro-slavery. There were abolitionists, but if you look at the, the bulk of, say, the church in the South, was pro-slavery, right? So you can say, okay, that's also a fair critique. You have these real problems, and then many times there is real complicity there uh, among the churches that they, they either promoted or did just ignore those, those problems. Okay, agreed. Right. The third step is the problem. The third step is to say, okay, we have problems. The church was complicit, was complicit in those problems. And the, the fault then is something deep. The fault mm. then is some deep underlying commitment to white supremacy within white evangelical theology. In other words, you know, years of participation in white supremacy and patriarchy and, and nationalism has corrupted evangelical theology. So now the solution going forward is to deconstruct that theology, to figure right. out you know, to, it's, something's wrong with it. It's been corrupted. We have to purify evangelicalism by getting this terrible, oppressive theology out of the church. Now, here's a problem right off the bat. Step one and two are largely okay. You can quibble with, well, the history is selective. Okay, I get, I get that. But largely, there were real problems. There are real problems. Two, there are churches that are complicit or were complicit. But then the third, the conclusion then is, therefore, the theology preached by these churches is corrupt. We should mm-hmm. dismantle it. So a timeout, timeout. How do you get from a positive claim, like these abuses happen, so statement, statement of fact, to a normative claim that this theology is wrong? We should change it. You, you can't do that. And I, I point out in the book, if you, ta- if you take that approach, it's, just, it's, just, it's, it's a fallacy because you could say, look at how the divinity of Christ became an excuse to persecute Jews in the Middle Ages. Right. Sure. So we got. So look, it's not enough to say, yeah, that was bad. We, we, we denounced that. It's not enough. You have to get this divinity of Christ theology out of your churches because it's going to lead. It, it was what led to the persecution of Jews. Right. Sure. But sure. Wait, wait, wait a minute here. The fact that this theology was used as an excuse for persecuting Jews does not mean the theology itself was false. You're abusing the theology. You're misrepresenting right, right. it. But they jump right from step two to step three. And now they'll claim that, well, we're just going to narrowly dismantle some oppressive theologies, although that we'll get in a second. They're, they're much more wide ranging than you might think. But that approach is just wrong because it will leave you open to deconstructing everything about the Christian faith because every every doctrine can be abused. Right, sure, every doctrine sure. can be corrupted. Every doctrine is is twisted by, by sinful human beings and used to hurt other people. Of course, we're sinners. It does not follow that the, the doctrine itself was, was, was false. And in the same way, you could say, you know what? Nuclear physics led to the atomic bomb. Therefore, it's yeah. false. Right. Sure, <laughs> sure. That doesn't follow. So- the danger here is that you're going to, if you adopt that methodology, show a problem, show that church is complicit in the problem, and therefore that church's theology must have been wrong, that will lead you to deconstruct the entire Christian faith. Yeah. Now, what do they narrowly want to focus on? Well, the problem is that they would go way beyond saying things like, well, we should get rid of the, uh, you know, a Mark of Cain theology. So slaveholders used to talk about how blacks were cursed or the, right. the curse of Ham theology to justify slavery. We should get rid of that theology. I'm like, of course we should. Totally agree. Yeah, sure. But why would I say that? I would say, well, that's totally unbiblical. That's com- terrible theology. The Bible does not teach that blacks were the children of Cain. They were cursed by their dark. Sin. No, it's all total trash. Okay. So I would point to the Bible and say the Bible doesn't 
endorse the theology at all, zero. But they would say, oh, but see, their approach is if the theology led to this thing we don't like, in any wow. way, the theology was bad. They wouldn't point to the Bible. So these books, because they're works of history and sociology, for, for the most part, they don't even attempt to look at scripture. And they would actually say, well, we're not doing his scripture, we're not doing exegesis, we're doing sociology and history. And right. my pushback is if you're making normative claims, if you're claiming the theology should be this way, you must appeal to scripture. You're not doing history or sociology anymore. You're doing theology. If you're going right, to do theology, right. you have to show why scripture justifies that theology. And they don't do that. They leap from history, sociology, and politics right to theology, which you can't do. Mm. And this is why then sociology becomes exalted in, mm -hmm. in this in this level, like how you then see how people interact and how they take power and use power. This then is the ultimate original sin, so to speak. Right. Yeah. They, it, it, they're just doing it backwards. You know, theology has to. So sociology is fine, it's, but it's a, a ministerial role. It has to be submitted to a, a larger theological framework, which we derive from the Bible. They're reversing yeah. that. They're saying. Sociology basically takes precedence or in practice they're doing that. And then we right. change our theology to make it fit our preferred social sociological conclusions. And you'll see this everywhere. And, and uh, one example would be, uh, I mean, all these books do this where they, they have some vision of what is good and right prior right. to the Bible. And then right. they appeal to sociology and history to make that case. And then they will, they, they, they don't even attempt to go to the Bible and say, well, how does the Bible fit into this? We'll just assume with that argument. Well, obviously, the Bible supports this vision of humanity, this vision of hierarchy, this vision of power when they've never made the case. Yes, this is so helpful. It seems like, uh, like for instance, with um, Jesus and John Wayne, there there is something that's appealing about piecing together. And not, don't get me wrong, I, I find I, 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 from the day one when I connected to that book um, and then listening to her talk. Uh, Kristen Kobes made that is I was I knew I just didn't feel it didn't sit right with me but I wasn't quite sure how to define it I'm sure she'd have a way that, that she could define why it doesn't sit why as a white <laughs> evangelical male but right. nevertheless like there's something clever about piecing together um things from Donald Trump to focus on the family to uh you know uh bi biblical uh, manhood or um various things that came about as a result of like th these images of trying to assert masculinity across mm -hmm. time. And then uh, obviously John Wayne too. So like, there was something that made sense. Like, Oh, all of these things are kind of related, but then like my, my question is like, where is this going? Yeah. Like, right. What type of world are we trying to create? And then what is that based on? Is it based upon the fact that there, okay, I can say there's been some problems with the way masculinity has been presented and abuses that have happened. But at the same time, like I'm not quite willing to say that the whole structure is wrong and right. everything needs to be thrown out. Yeah. And so, so she'll, and she'll, that's right. So she'll argue, you know, without any appeal to scripture that somehow all of this, the, sub, the book subtitle was how, like, how white <laughs> evangelicals yeah. corrupted the faith and fractured a nation. Well, how, I mean, you corrupted the faith. That implies that there is some pure and uncorrupted Christian faith. Well, what is it? She doesn't tell you. She just assumes that all of this patriarchy stuff is a corruption of the, the true and pure Christian faith. But for her, it's pretty clear that she rejects anything that, that has to do with gender roles. Or And, and, and frankly, it's, it's pretty, become more and more clear. It's clear in the book, I think, personally, but it's also been clear from her responses that she's also um, you know, in favor of affirming LGBTQ identities. She's She's right, fully right. affirming. And that's, again, I think it's, I'll read that in the book. She talks about how um, the, the boundaries of evangelicalism, what defined evangelicalism was patriarchal power, right? Right. Now, but how did that patriarchal boundaries, how did those show up? She says it's the doctrines of watershed issues like complementarianism, the prohibition right. of homosexuality, the existence of hell, and substitutionary atonement. Those doctrines, in her book, says in page 204, those doctrines were shaped by, in her words, a common commitment to patriarchal power. Mm. So mm. if the thing about the that, so she's saying yeah. patriarchal power is expressed in those the doctrines you named, complementarianism, but all which is again the complementarianism means that men and women are equally valuable but have different roles. That's right. one. Okay, that kind of makes sense. That sort of sounds like it has to do with gender, but the other one was 
prohibition of homosexuality is a matter about patriarchy. Existence of hell, patriarchy. Right. Yeah, substitution of your atonement, patriarchy. Like Jesus died on the cross for your sins and paid the penalty that you deserve. That's somehow connected to patriarchy. Well, what happens then if you believe that and then dismantle patriarchy? Well, all yeah, those yeah. doctrines basically have to be modified because they're just patriarchal. So all of that's obviously should be troubling. And a lot of people just drift into this because it sounds just like, well, I'm against the patriarchy. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, what does that entail? I don't know, but it sounds like it's progressive. I'll do it. <laughs> and yeah. then only later you turn around and say, wait a minute, if, if I follow this consistently, it's going to dismantle a lot more than just, even just gender roles. It's going to dismantle gender, gender, gender binary, sexual ethics, substitutionary atonement, inerrancy. All these different issues are tied in her mind to patriarchy. And you can see that same tendency in, in like Beth Allison's bars, uh, uh, what was it? Biblical, the, the, biblical womanhood. Yeah. The making of biblical womanhood, um, uh, and Christian, the book on Christian nationalism by Whitehead and Perry called, um, uh, taking America back for God. They also tie Christian nationalism into things like, uh, uh rejection of homosexuality and pro-life activism right, Interesting, is correlated yeah. with Christian nationalism. And it, so all of those, and the, and the reason, and this is why you'd have to go outside the book a little bit, why would you connect pro-life activism with Christian nationalism and with white evangelicalism, all these different things? Well, it makes sense within the framework of contemporary critical theory, where you have oppressors right. and oppressed. And actually, the, the other piece of the puzzle is the theory of intersectionality, that all right, of these right, right. oppressions are interlocking. And so actually, for example, in um, Beth Allison's Barr's book, and actually all the books, they will talk about how all of these issues of oppression and dominance are interconnected. So, uh, for example, let me pull a quote here. Um, uh, in uh, so Jones, okay, I'm going to find the actual quote. Um, darn, I gotta well, find it. Yeah, well, if you look for that, I'll I'll describe a scenario sure. um, that's connected to my denomination that I've grown up in, in the Salvation Army. So interesting enough, um, like in, in people in my sphere of the theological world, and, and connected to the seminary where I serve, Wesley Biblical Seminary, we affirm women in ministry, but often take on still like definite, distinct roles for men and women. Mm. And the in some of those things is being a part of the creation order like this, mm. but at the same time, not but still allowing for women to be involved in ministry. And that mm. was part of the, the founding of many denominations are connected to our seminary in the Wesleyan holiness tradition in the Salvation Army as well. So mm. there is um, early women in ministry. Now what's happened, it was interesting as things have gone up, gone on and progress, um, it, the husband and wife in the Salvation Army were always uh, both ordained and served together in ministry. So my wife and I were sent to various appointments and we served together and we shared in, in the ministry. But what happened very naturally as we had children was that she stayed home with our kids more. Mm -hmm. And then um, I took, I had administrative experiences. Um, I preached more and then um, led to a place where like I was taking on more of the administrative roles that ended up being kind of like what men would do. And this is what's happened over decades and generations mm -hmm. in the system. So much so that, there was not until just recently in the last 10 years, there was never uh, there, the Salvation Army officer pastoral team was always a couple, but it was always the men who had the administrative appointments. Mm -hmm. And e even long after kids were out of the house, and that sort of thing. And so what would happen is then um, there weren't any married women who were in roles above their husband husbands. Now, I just laid out for you why I think that happened. I think it happened because of the very natural, pragmatic factors, the fact sure. that my, only my wife could breastfeed, and <laughs> that meant that she had to do certain things at home, right? Well, um, this then has led to people saying there has been a great injustice, systemic injustice right. across the denomination that women have been put, in, and certainly, let me just be clear, there have been examples where married women have been put pushed down or not because mm. of being, but not across the board that mm. has been the case. But instead what's happened is this type of analysis has led to saying there's been a systematic injustice that has happened. And now we need to correctively come in and appoint women 
uh, right. married women because there's been injustice there. And what's and and so it's like a it's a similar type of argument that comes in that isn't necessarily related to like what's going on. I, I mean, I think there's just a deeper analysis. Like there's other explanations sure. beyond the fact that people have been uh, unjustly punished because of their gender. This is very similar to this is comes from critical theory. It's the idea that disparities are a symptom of discrimination. That's right. the, the idea is that if you see disparity of any kind, it's from these subtle forces of injustice that are operating. Even if you deny it, if you say, no, there's a reason for these disparities. It's not anything intentional or insidious. It's just the fact, like you said, like, well, when my wife was breastfeeding our kids for 10 years. And so, yeah, of course she's going to be, you know, have a, a lesser role in active ministry because she's busy. No, it's not that. It's that that's that's your excuse as a white male for explaining and justifying right. your dominance. It's not yeah, actually right, yeah. right. So that's how it's explained away. You, your actual re real explanations are explained away as a, a power play. Let me. So here's the quotes I found. So okay, yeah, they they do connect all of these different oppressions. So for example, Beth Allison Barr cites Tisby explicitly and says, Jamar Tisby writes, "quote Racism never goes away; it just adapts." The same is true of patriarchy. Like racism, patriarchy is a shapeshifter, conforming to each new area, era, looking as if it has always belonged. So she's seeing an intersectional connection between racism and sexism, and then they're, they're very similar. They act the same way. They both function to subordinate one class of people. Um, Whitehead and Perry, they write that Christian nationalism glorifies the patriarchal heterosexual family as not only God's biblical standard, but the cornerstone of all thriving civilizations. Now think about that for a second. Does Christian nationalism exalt patriarchal heterosexual family as God's biblical standard? Maybe it does, but it's right. It, 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 marriage in a family is the cornerstone of all thriving civilizations. Like, that's not Christian. That's again creational it's Christian. order. <laughs> yeah, it's like, this is how it works. Like it, it cannot be exalted. Yeah. And so it, it, it dies out. <laughs> here's one from uh, this is Robert Jones, who's uh, so he writes this in his book, White Too Long. It says, what if conceptions of marriage and family, of biblical inerrancy, or even the concept of having a personal relationship with Jesus developed right. as, a, as they did because they were useful tools for reinforcing white dominance? Wow. So now white dominance is being reinforced by things like inerrancy. Marriage and family, uh, having a personal relationship with well, Jesus, a personal relationship it, with Jesus, yeah, is somehow put into white dominance because it, it's all systems of power in their minds. They're all connected. All you know, race has to do with marriage and sex and gender and and nationalism. They're all these interlocking systems of oppression, and they have to. All, and so you can't. I mean, one of the one of the core tenets of critical race theory is that you can't analyze just race, which is. Uh, so funny because people will say we're going to apply critical race theory just to race. And I'll like quote critical race theorists to them saying you can't do that. One of the cornerstone right. beliefs of critical race theory has always been for three decades. You cannot separate issues of race from issues of gender and sexuality and class, et cetera. Intersectionalities yeah, so it just, has to be a part of it. It's a part, it, it, yes. it's a package deal. Uh, Kiara Bridges, who's a professor at UC Berkeley says actually just bluntly, she says, uh, intersectionality is not an amendment to critical race theory. Intersectionality is critical race theory. Wow. It's just, it's just, she's a, and she has a great book. I mean, it's not, <laughs> she's a critical race theorist, but it's a great book for explaining critical race theory uh, called CRT, a primer from 2019. But it's actually, it's the number one book I'd recommend for people wanting to understand critical race theory. Uh, but yeah, she, but it's very, uh, if you go back to 1993 in words that wound, the founders of CRT are saying that one of the core tenets, one of the six core tenets of CRT, the defining elements is that uh, race, gender, and sexuality are all you know, these interlocking systems of dominance. We have to pull down all hierarchies at the same time through, quote, massive social transformation. That mm. is one of the core tenets of CRT, according to its mm. co co-founders. So yeah, the, the point is, again, I want to emphasize, I'm not just pointing a finger and saying these people are critical theorists, therefore what they're saying is false. I'm right. critiquing what they actually say in their books and then stepping back and asking now that we've critiqued it and said, these are not, these are wrong ideas, but now where do these ideas come from? How do we understand them as a as part of a larger framework, which is a, a valid enterprise? You want to understand, well, 
not just what they're saying, why it's wrong, but also how did they come to think in these terms? I think that will help us as Christians to say, no, I can't think in those terms. Race and gender are not, are not the same thing. Race Mm. is a social construct. You know, we have invented things like black. I love, I love this Asian people. And I'm like, I'm, you know, (laughs) I'm, I'm I'm half Asian. I'm like Asian people an Asian American. Have you been to Asia? It's a big (laughs) place. Oh, he's an Asian. How many, there are 4 billion people in Asia. There are yeah, like, you know, yeah. dozens of countries in India. There are like hundred different languages, major languages. These countries have been fighting each other for centuries and you're going to, oh, they're Asian. That's not, that's a category we created or, or right. black, you know, this one's black. I mean, they, they could be from Ghana or the Caribbean, or they could be from the, you know, they could have had ancestors that came over here in the 17th century, longer than I, my family's name. So the point is, Saying that they're black, that's a category, a bucket that we have invented. You go to Brazil, there are other categories that they've invented. You go to India. So the point is, but but to race is a social construct, but gender is not. Gender is God yeah. ordained. You cannot treat them at the same level because they are totally ontologically different. I, you know, I have a, I am XY chromosomes. I'm a man. I have a male gender. Uh, but this idea that I'm half Asian, that's a thing that American, that's our American 21st century yeah. idea that it's, it's very contextual. It's very culturally situated anyway. But the fact that critical race theorists and other critical theorists will treat these two categories as they're both in their mind, socially constructed gender, yeah. just as much as yeah. race or right off the bat, Christians should say, no, I can't think in those categories. That's wrong. But we often get caught up in this way of thinking without realizing the implications for things like transgender and sexuality. Yeah, I've seen uh, Coleman Hughes has talked about the idea of colorblindness and like mm. and, and, you know, a lot of times that's thought of in a negative way, like, oh, well, that's you're, you're refusing to see um, what makes me who I am as part of my identity as a white man. What do you what, what do you think? Is, is that a way forward to think about looking at people individually? As people like, obviously, we recognize where people come from and the color of people's skin, but at the same time, like trying to strive to not work with people, not judge people, not not come up with pre ideas of what they have might, their experiences might have been out based on their color. Is color blindness a way forward? No, so uh, George Yancey is a socio- an evangelical sociologist yeah. at Baylor, and he's written some good books and critiquing both anti racism and color blindness and pointing out that. Right. I think so. There's a sense in which colorblindness is not just good, but mandated. We should not be judging people based on their skin color. We should not be thinking evil thoughts of anyone based on just their appearance. That's it. Doesn't matter their their skin color, their hair color, their eye color, anything about their externality. We should strive to be like God and look on the inside and ask, you know, look at their heart and their uh, their character. So that's a good kind of colorblindness. But to say we're going to be colorblind in the sense of just ignoring race. We're not even considering race in our analyses. Well, that's foolish because racism exists and has existed right, sure. and has shaped people's yeah. lives. And so sometimes people, Christians will say, well, we should be colorblind, not just in terms of not judging others on the basis of the race, which is good. I appreciate the sentiment, but I'm saying we can't even talk about race. We shouldn't consider it at all in anything. Well, that's foolish. An example, a simple one would be, uh, should we be color? Should we have been colorblind in like, 1869, you know, four years after the Civil War, when there's humongous, a humongous shattering impacts of slavery that are, that are just right there. It's present. Well, no, no, but we, we want to be colorblind now. We, we're moving beyond all that stuff. But well, no, blacks, not whites, not Native Americans, blacks were systematically oppressed and brutalized for 200 years. So you have to take that into account. You can't just water on the bridge. No. Now, of course, today, 2023, we're not living in 1869, right? We're, we yeah, we yeah. have made tremendous progress in our society. Praise God. But it, there's still situations in which people will suffer racism and it's disproportionately anti-Black racism. You can look at hate crime statistics in the FBI. Blacks are 13 times more likely to, su- to experience a hate crime than whites. That's just the data by the yeah, race. Sure, sure. Uh, there's studies that I quote in various places showing that blacks, uh, when you do careful studies, not just disparities, but you can go and do measurable studies of hiring discrimination, 
um, uh, policing disparity, uh, not disparities, right, right, but right. Into discrimination. So you can't just, I'm not saying, oh, appeal disparities. I'm saying, no, do studies that control right, for right. other variables, control for things like age, control for experience. And you can still see that blacks say have a far less chance of being inter- uh, receiving callbacks for interviews during hiring because of their skin color, because of their race. Right, right. So it doesn't make sense in that context. We know that race is affecting people's, uh, uh, it, it, people are being discriminated against because of their race. You can't then just ignore race. Race has to be a factor when you say, well, you know, is this policy actually fair? When a company yeah, says, sure. hey, we don't discriminate, and you look at the data and says, well, no, it looks like you do. You can't, well, you can't look at the data. We shouldn't collect the data because that's not, it's not colorblind. No, no. When it's a category that's being used to perpetrate injustice, you can consider it. It's, it's a totally valid. An example that I, I've used before, imagine a Christian college that was explicitly segregated in 1960. 1970, sure. they changed their policy. They say, hey, we repent. That was wrong. We now admit black students. So that's great. On the books, they're now totally, that's right. They've repented. Right, right. But the student body is still 99% white in 2023. Now, if you're truly colorblind, we should not consider race at all. You're like, well, I can't, we shouldn't even ask why that is. We can't, we shouldn't take a thing about race. We shouldn't ask about how we can make do outreach to black students because that would be non colorblind. Whereas I would say, well, wait a minute. Why are you 99.9% white? Could it be that students coming to your school know its history? And they're like, so a black student who comes to school is like, hey, this school was segregated like 50 years ago. I don't know if I want to go here. So maybe you should think about that and say, hey, we should make sure that prospective students know that we've changed. Maybe a lot of uh, college admissions comes through alumni networks, right? So-and-so's dad went to the school. And so then they recommend it to their kids, their kids apply. But you don't have any black alumni. Why? Because you discriminated against them for 100 years. So you can't turn around... In, in, a, in a day and be like, well, now we can ignore all that. No, you should, because you don't have black alumni because of your institutional sin. So right. now you should go back and say, hey, we have to reach out extra, extra hard to black students. Why? Because we're trying to repair the damages done by our own sin. Right. Again, you can't, that can't be approached in a totally colorblind way. Now right. I'm not right. saying, what I'm not saying is we should change the admission standards to right. boost our numbers. Because I think that's also runs afoul of biblical sins and partiality. But you can say, how are our past sins? How is the state of the United States, the actual factual history of the U.S. and the factual history of our school or our community? How is that impacting the barriers to entry that our school is facing? Right, right, right. So I'm, point, I'm pointing out there's a way to approach colorblindness can be biblical, but also colorblindness can be unnecessarily it's actually, it's, it's too much. It's making it too hard to correct course and to remedy the effects of past sin, which we right. should not do that. We shouldn't be so, basically don't be so dogmatic about uh, ignoring race, take it into right. account in a biblical way. Yeah, that is great. That's really helpful. The, um, it's interesting. It's been in the news here lately. I attended Asbury University, which is all over the news mm-hmm. right now because of the outpouring revival, whatever we wanted to describe it. Um, and I, I think it was until the mid '60s where they had, you know, they they wouldn't admit an American African American, mm-hmm. uh, maybe like a missionary or something like this. Well, um, it, like that that was taken down. But still, when I was there, they were still. It was very small percentage. Well, now it's they, they've. I, I'm not exactly sure their, their whole process of how they've how they've gotten there, but I think it, certainly leaning into um, a admissions opportunity, like of making sure that you're like aggressively going to places to know that you're available, a place that right, they can yeah. recruit from and that sort of thing. Well, I think it, I'm not exactly sure where it is, but I think I want to say it's like 70% white at mm-hmm. this point. But one of the critiques has been uh, from some people who are not happy about what's happening at the revival. So it's just a, a, a white school. Uh, same thing. Yeah. Isn't it wild? Like, and I, and to me, I'm like, man, if you only knew how it was 20 years right. ago when yeah, I was yeah, there. Yeah. Like, yeah. So there, there's those type of um, challenge. And I, and I bet, and we here at Wesley Biblical Seminary, interestingly enough, come from a tradition that had been a part of a segregated past, like one of the denominations that had helped to, to uh, be a part of our, our founding. 50 years ago. But interesting enough, Neil, you might find this interesting. Um, when we had our, we are accredited through the Association of Theological Schools and then also through the Association of Biblical Higher Education, uh, they compared our stats to 
all the other 250 plus ATS seminaries. And they said that we were the most racially balanced seminary. Hmm. We had 51% non-white students. <laughs> um, and, and then the kind of question is, well, how'd you get there? And this was before I got to the seminary and people looked around and said, um, we don't know. Yeah. And it wasn't through a racial diversity officer. It wasn't through a DEI program, re-education. In part, and what, so in looking at it, it was leaning in to denominations that are in our theological tradition where there was historic black congregations that needed pastors in our yeah. area. And we and, and then we had, um, interesting, uh, a bishop from African-American, traditionally Af African-American denomination said, don't change what you're doing. It's like the one place where I've been. So it's it's been an interesting journey for us thinking about that. But but still, it doesn't mean ignoring the past. And, and sure, yeah. And both I know both schools, Asbury and then Wesley, have have repented for what mm -hmm. they've done for the past. I mean, that has to be a clear part of it. So colorblindness doesn't work exactly in those scenarios. But there is a way that it can be. I appreciate you parsing out those differences. Yeah, and I think other thing too is that institutions, I think, can and sometimes repent for their past actions as an institution. So like if a seminary that excluded black students, they can, because what does repentance mean biblically? Repentance means a change of mind leading to a change of behavior. So when right, your policy right, right. was excluding blacks and you've changed your mind and it leads to a change in behavior, that's repentance. Well, I we have to be careful though, is calling say a white person to repent for the past actions of some generation. That they, yeah. you know, so for what, whites in uh, the past, it's like, there are so many problems with that because they, the big one is this repentance means biblically changing your mind, leading to a change of behavior. But if you're a white person today and you're asked to repent for say a repent of slavery, repent of Jim Crow, how can you change your mind? If you loathe slavery and Jim Crow, you can't right, change your right, mind. Right. And how can you change your behavior? Cause what are you doing right now that you can change? So that's very dangerous because well, just it's just mis it's misusing a biblical word and concept in a way that's logically impossible. I cannot change my mind if my mind's already made up. Yeah. I cannot change my behavior if I'm doing the thing that I'm already supposed to be doing. So I, again, that, that's, that's why though. That's why institutions can do that because they're signaling officially as institution. I mean, not the actual person in charge of it because they're dead now. But we're, we're in our policy now is changing we right, reject right. that so it's an important point because there are people calling for sort of corporate repentance on behalf of the whites and i keep pointing out what is that how does that correspond to the biblical category of repentance because it right, doesn't seem like right, it can right. especially when it's an individual supposedly right. being called to repentance for things that they didn't do uh anyway there, there's lots of problems with that whole view but I, i've talked about it before but that's a there's a big careful thing be care again we're talking about precision even with colorblindness we're not claiming that colorblindness is all evil and is nothing but an excuse for racism that's not what we're saying some right, critical right, race right, theorists right. might say that but we're not saying that there is a sense in which colorblindness is good and biblical but then there's another sense in which we have to be color aware so you have to be there aware of history and aware and, and else you can also ask questions you can say not if there are disparities there is racism not saying right, that, right, right. But if there are disparities, could there be racism? Even unintentional policies that produce these, right, yeah, it's possible. Right. So you can at least. So I, I just want people to not be so terrified of wokeness that they ignore legitimate concerns that right. we should, as Christians, say, yeah, hey, that's that's totally fair. If you're a ninety nine point nine nine percent white campus, you should, hey, 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 is that okay? Now, by the way, you might come back and say it's fine. You know why? Because you live in Norway, <laughs> so you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh no, we're ninety nine point nine nine percent white. Why? Because you're living in a village in Norway, and and that's your seminary is there, and you know all your students come from there, and yeah, it's not because you're racist. So there, are, I'm just saying is in a, try to apply biblical thinking and not immediately denounce things as either woke or anti woke. You should just say right. what does the Bible say about these ideas. And I think you also gave a helpful word to there to think about the sin of partiality that mm. there it can it, you could say then as a result we are going to raise the tuition for anybody who's white and then yeah, right. give a free tuition for anybody who's black. That's how we're going to correct this injustice. Yeah. So like th I think that's one way just to be cautious um, and and not to uh, disable the meritorious nature of some of these things. Sure. 
So Neil, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you for me. I've, I've I really appreciate your work. One more question. Um, uh, my podcast is called more to the story. And I'm just curious, is there more to the story of Neil Shimvi than is normally told? And you get to tell in these type of interviews or something you like to do? Um, I basically have just been doing critical theory for the last five years. So I, <laughs> I actually, though, the nice thing is I'm kind of not wrapping this up, but uh, my collaborator, Dr. Pat Sawyer, and I have just finished writing a book called Critical Dilemma, mm. which will be published in the fall okay. by Harvest House. And it is going to be a comprehensive, we're hoping definitive response to critical social theory from a Christian perspective. So it is, and it is, you'll see, but it is, um, it is comprehensive. It is definitive. It is highly sourced. Um, it's around 750 plus footnotes. Wow. Thousands of words of direct quotes from, from critical theorists themselves. So what we're hoping, and it treats all these issues, like how should we think about race and gender and sexuality? And, um, but it, uh, yeah, that will, that that's more to the story. So that's more to come. And, okay. um, it, I, we really want to equip the church, especially young people to understand these issues and why we're not just these knee jerk conservatives who just don't want to be, don't, don't, we just love the status quo. We just want to defend our white privilege. It's no, we are concerned about the soul of the church and basic Christian theology, which will be harmed by and is being harmed by these ideas. Yeah. And we can, we can, we can hold on to a desire for justice and a rejection of racism. We can do all of that while also rejecting critical social theory firmly. Yes. Uh, and I think it's really important for the health of the church to do that. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Neil. We appreciate your ministry and people can find links to uh, his website in, in the show notes. So thanks so much for checking in. Thanks for your time, Neil. Great. Thank you, Andy.